see there's some hands that didn't raise, Gene. That's okay, you're welcome anyway. I was just curious. Well, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Sherry Goodman from the uh, Consortium for Ocean Leadership. And as I think all of you know, COL, or Ocean Leadership for short, is first and foremost an advocacy group for member institutions, the federal level, for interfacing with policymakers. And it is also, uh, I think, endeavors to be a voice for the larger ocean sciences community, regardless of whether you are a member uh, or not. But considerable changes in ocean leadership lately with Bob Gagosian, who is the founding president, retiring, moving on, Sherry, the new president, coming in for three months now. And, uh, and of course, right at a time when our nation is debating the uh, merits of fundamental research particularly as it relates to the oceans, in our case here, relevant to us. And, and those debates have profound impact on us as a community. And so we're fortunate to have Sherry here today to tell us about what's happening. And there'll be a lot of time for discussion. So uh, feel free to ask questions, uh, spark conversation afterwards. So without further ado, Sherry. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Uh, in fact, it's, it's just great to be here out of Washington, uh, here on the West Coast. I think I see our future field office. I think I'm looking at it right now. Um, so this is, a, this is a great to be here with, um, with each of you today and talk to you about ocean leadership. Um, uh, our challenges, our opportunities, and how together we can create a better tomorrow. I think I probably should start with a little bit about um, me and how I've come to ocean leadership so you know who I am and how I fit into the ocean science uh, community. First, a true confession, I'm actually not a scientist. Um, I'm actually trained as a lawyer and in public policy. I was Huey's lawyer in the early part of my career. Um, when they were doing the overhaul, overhaul of the Knorr and the Melville ships. Anybody remember those vessels, right? Okay, back in the 90s, uh, they ran into some uh, challenges with the shipyard uh, down in Louisiana, and I was part of the legal team based in Boston uh, that on behalf of uh, Scripps and, and Huey uh, took care of the, that was a large construction litigation and arbitration uh, with the Louisiana shipyard and uh, supported by the Navy and ONR in particular. So uh, that was uh, my, my trial by, by fire in uh, uh, as both as a young lawyer and learning the oceanographic ocean research community. Spent a lot of long winter days down at Huey. This is well before when all the files were st still paper and we had to go through and do, uh, do all that discovery and then uh, depose the uh, various players from uh, the Huey president at the time, Craig Dorman, down to the shipyard uh, supervisors and super uh, down in Louisiana. Uh, I've worked on the Senate Armed Services Committee for Sam Nunn when he was chairman of that committee. Uh, so I've had some experience uh, working in Congress. I served eight years in the Department of Defense as a deputy undersecretary of defense, defense for environment safety and occupational health, also at the time known as environmental security, um, at a time when the military in the early 90s was largely seen um, as an environmental laggard. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud to say that in the, the eight years that I was served in the Department of Defense, um, where one of my bosses was Bill Perry, who's now at Stanford, Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, who was a terrific secretary of defense and uh, a passionate lover of the oceans himself. Um, went from being an seen as an environmental laggard to being an environmental lead and clean energy leader. And is still today um, recognized widely as such as being at the forefront of major uh, initiatives on climate change and, uh, and clean energy. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And then uh, the last 14 years, I served at a Navy think tank called Center for Naval Analysis. And I wore a number of hats there from uh, 
Senior Vice President, General Counsel, um, involved with the corporate board, and also founder of the CNA Military Advisory Board on uh, National Security and Climate Change that has um, helped to shape a conversation nationwide on national security and climate change. So that's a little bit about my background. In between that, I've also served as a HUI trustee until I came into this position, so I have the opportunity to see uh, that research. And uh, also just love to be, grew up by the oceans, both in, in New York and uh, Massachusetts. Uh, my mother lives on Cape Cod. Uh, my, my husband is from this part of the country. Uh, he grew up in San Jose and still has family in this area. So very much love coming out here uh, to the West Coast. So, um, I want to talk with you today about where we are at ocean leadership and tell a story in three parts. Uh, history, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, where we are today, and where I hope we can go together. Okay. All right, Tim, what am I doing wrong here? There we go. No? All right, I'll let you, I'll let you click it. There we go. Okay, good. There we go. Okay, um, the history of uh, ocean leadership started back with the drilling programs uh, when it was known as JOY and really managed those scientific um, ocean programs. Admiral Watkins, with whom I actually had the pleasure of working when he was Secretary of Energy after he had been Chief of Naval Operations, wonderful man, set a great vision um, for the oceans, elevate the voice of the ocean sciences in Washington. And he helped to bring this community of which you all are a part now together. And uh, his vision is still very powerful and he's still remembered as a great, great leader. Um, CORE was formed um, also to bring together the uh, research and education programs. And uh, as you probably know, CORE and JOY merged in 2007. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, that's the community that I feel I've joined today that is still um, in the process of really being united into the full form of, the, of ocean leadership. Okay. It's the other button. There we go. Okay. So, who are our members? Well, here you can see we are the premier ocean science research institutions, um, aquaria, and industry. And we have some of our industry, industry partners here in the room today from a number of um, industry reps here in California. Very pleased to have them here. Here's here are our California members, and we have an opportunity, I think, to grow and expand our voice here. And one of the ways we can uh, think about is to bring more of our industry partners in. And I think here in California, you've already begun to do a good job. Uh, and as we look across the country at our membership and with the growth of and opportunities for blue growth and blue economy, we, I think we have an opportunity to uh, increase our uh, industry collaboration. We'll get into that as well. Okay, ocean leadership today. What do we do today? Uh, we advance ocean science, uh, education, research, and sound ocean policy. We advocate for that on the Hill. Uh, we're in some discussions this week. Uh, in Congress, we manage scientific ocean programs, and we coordinate and facilitate collaborations among institutions like this here and the consortium here in California and various government entities and across the country. Now, we face three main challenges which um, we need to talk about today, uh, and they are downward funding pressure, politicization of science, and then also transition in science infrastructure programs. 
OK, so the, the downward funding pressure really starts. The big picture is the Budget Control Act, also known as sequestration. And that's put a cap on federal spending across the board, um, you know, including in the national security community from which I hail. But it's really affected all federal funding. Um, then, secondly, within that, there are the cuts to uh, science funding across federal agencies, which is most directly right now affecting uh, NSF, National Science Foundation. And um, so that the, the impact is that flat is the new doubling. Um, the, the growth that was quite possible in the uh, few years ago during the stimulus programs, that's gone now. Um, and we're really living in a different, we're really living in a different time. And then there is the sea change report. Most of you are probably familiar with this, the decadal survey of the oceans, which uh, is proposing a rebalance across the various accounts uh, within uh, NSF funding of ocean sciences. And that's also having an impact um, here that's affecting the research quite significantly. OK, now just on that, because I know it affects many of you um, and the work that you do. So Ocean Leadership has been working with NSF to ensure that the community has input into the response to that report. Um, you know, we've been part of that effort to rebalance uh, infrastructure and research investments. We are working with NSF to help build support for the Ocean Observing Initiative user engagement because, of course, that will be critical to sort of making that infrastructure investment a reality and building more support for it and utility of it over time. Um, also looking at the efficient use of the various research platforms. Um, and finally, of course, we want to advocate for more resources to alleviate some of those cuts. And we're going to talk about ways that we can do that. OK, so the second challenge is this overall politicization of science um, in the US, which is, a, which is an unfortunate but, um, trend, but something that we have to deal with, which is that um, you know, the value and credibility of scientists in certain quarters is sometimes drawn into question. The peer review process has come under attack. Um, we have this whole realm of climate skeptics over the last decade or so that has been fueled by an industry with particular interest in that. And then there's also the congressionally proposed cuts to the NSF GEO, NASA Earth, and NOAA climate budgets. So all of those uh, are a, a, a very difficult combination. And then finally, within um, ocean leadership itself, it's an organization in transition now as these three major science infrastructure programs, the first two OIDP and, and USIP, um, are being transitioned to be managed um, elsewhere. And OOI uh, is now in a transition from its construction phase headed later this year into actual operations. All right, so with all that lovely background, uh, OK, we're gonna, now going to talk about the good stuff, Ocean Leadership 2.0 and uh, reimagining Admiral Watkins' uh, vision for ocean leadership. Um, you, know, I have, I, you know, I believe firmly that advocating for funding um, our own voices no longer are enough to, to um, change the conversation uh, on the value of science and ocean science in particular. Um, we, we really need to begin and broaden the conversation that I see already starting out here. As usual, California is leading the nation in innovation and, and how, to, how to look to the future to reframe uh, our discussions on ocean solutions supported by science as a way that we can bring the conversation about the importance of science to more and different communities around the nation. So that, as I would say, like to say, my mother understands, you know, why it matters. Um, and uh, Joe Sixpack, you know, in the heartland, understands why ocean science matters um, in, in his community. And some of the ways the strategic initiatives 
we're going to use to create these partnerships to increase the impact of science on policy are first uh, federal ocean, we're convening the federal ocean scientists, federal chief ocean scientists. Uh, we're looking at an oceans and national security initiative, uh, further industry engagement, and finally opportunities in technology development. And in case you didn't know, that's yours truly with Senators Murkowski and Angus King of Maine. OK, um, convening the, the chief ocean scientists, federal chief ocean scientists. Um, we're going to bring them together. We've got our first meeting later this month, the end of this month, um, to help strength, to give us more help from our core sponsors. Um, they have uh, expressed interest directly to me, uh, folks like Rick Spinrad, uh, Rick Murray, um, folks in ONR, other parts of Navy, and these other agencies, uh, to help them think through what are their emerging needs, uh, how we can help them further, uh, give them a way to interact outside the more formal interagency process, which in Washington um, can often be kind of stultifying and often has so many players that you can't get anything done. So in Ocean Leadership, we've got a nice space there. We've got a place that they can come informally. Most of them are people I have known uh, for, much of, for much of my life, and give them a place to come together and let us help them, and they can help us. So I am particularly interested you know, sort of in hearing from you how this kind of group can help you. Some of the ideas we've already discussed um, in some other, in earlier discussions today include how do we bridge the, get the uh, make the bridge from the science to the technology applications, and how do we have more federal support uh, for cross-agency uh, support for technology applications and funding. So that's, I know, one of the challenges. I'm looking forward to hearing from you about that. But I'm very excited about bringing the ocean scientists, uh, federal chief ocean scientists together. Oh, well, OK. Well, uh, I know all right, I want you to hear this. Then I'll talk about it. Refuse to admit that climate change is real. And on a day like today, it's hard to get too worried about it. There are folks who will equivocate. And they'll say, you know, I'm not a scientist. Well, I'm not either. But the best scientists in the world know that climate change is happening. Our analysts in the intelligence community know climate change is happening. Our military leaders, generals and admirals, active duty and retired, know it's happening. Our homeland security professionals know it is happening, and our Coast Guard knows it's happening. The science is indisputable. OK. Uh, that, of course, is the, our president uh, in a speech last month to the Coast Guard Academy uh, talking about the importance of climate change uh, as a national security challenge. I and, whoops, there we go. Okay. Um, connecting the dots uh, on the value of science uh, to an important national security question has been something I've been personally involved with. Uh, through the work here of the CNA Military Advisory Board. And that has enabled the science, climate science, to be understood and talked about in a, in a way that was different than previously and understood as a national security challenge, indeed as a threat multiplier. Uh, I think we have the opportunity at Ocean Leadership and with the ocean science community to connect the value and importance of our ocean sciences uh, to, the, to our nation's security. And I know from the work that I've done that it is increasingly important, the ocean science research is increasingly important to our national security in the Pacific, uh, in the Arctic, in various places around the world, and that we can begin to change the conversation on the value of, uh, and importance of ocean sciences by connecting it to national security. As you see now has been done uh, uh, in uh, when the president's speech here is sort of the culmination of eight years of work, a 
which myself and many others were a part of, uh, the military, the military leaders who were involved with me on this, retired three and four stars from across all of our services, are a trusted voice of experience. And they're able to take a conversation um, that's hard to have in uh, certain parts of the country and have, and have that conversation with the, uh, where you're not preaching to the converted. Uh, so it's easy here in California to talk about climate change, and you don't really don't have to have a national security framework to do that. But there are other parts of the country uh, today where if you want to talk about climate change, it's considered a taboo subject. But if the military uh, comes in and starts to talk about why clean energy is important to our troops and why sea, sea level rise is impacting the readiness of our military installations, and how it's going to make it harder for our forces to operate in various regions of the world uh, today, people will listen. Uh, and I think we have that same opportunity here to change that conversation. So um, we are uh, going to be creating an Oceans and National Security Council com comprised of our ocean scientists uh, from this community and retired senior military leaders. Um, as well as uh, other policy makers and industry leaders to look at specific topics of oceans and national security. Here are some of the ones we may, we may take up. I'm interested in your ideas. Food security is one I think is very important. Oceans and food security has a broad impact, is going to affect all of us, has a global impact, uh, one where the science is incredibly important and a lot going on now. Uh, the Arctic. That's very much, uh, you know, a lot going on in the Arctic with the U.S. chairing the Arctic Council now for the next two years with ge geostrategic changes uh, happening, uh, increasing, with the, increasing with Russia's military activity in the Arctic and, of course, uh, with much more uh, transit opportunities open there and uh, just a whole region, a whole new ocean opening up. Sea level rise and coastal resiliency, also very important. You know that here, but that conversation is happening around the country, and those impacts are being felt everywhere, um, you know, from the Gulf to the Northwest. And then there are a variety of other topics we could think about. I'm excited to get that going uh, for ocean leadership. Uh, third, we're going to connect, uh, deepen our connections in ocean leadership with industry. Uh, we already have, and we have well represented here today, industry that works with us uh, on test bed opportunities and some strategic partnerships. I think we have further opportunities to grow those. Uh, and industry has a big voice, um, a big voice in, in Congress. And that's where we need industry to Share its, uh, share its views and the value of ocean sciences. Also, uh, workforce development. Um, you're actually training a lot of the workforce that goes into the um, blue economy, into the mar marine industries today, whether it's oil and gas, telecom, um, transit, uh, other opportunities. So you, you are right there training their future workforce. Uh, joint advocacy, I believe, will be more powerful when we have them at our side. And also, we're the engine of the blue economy here. And that's obvious here in California, but now I'm beginning to hear those conversations elsewhere around the country as well, and that's exciting. And I think there'll be some opportunities for us in that area as well. And finally, um, connecting ocean leadership to technology development. Uh, it really, I'm picking up on ideas that you all have here in, in California and ones that Ocean Leadership and, uh, has really begun uh, with its uh, looking at future technologies for, um, for example, ocean acidification. And what I want to help do is ha facilitate a full spectrum of science to operations. I know from my, my time working in, in defense that often the basic research, 6162 research, um, you know, then has a hard time getting uh, commercialized or put into operational use and goes into this valley of death. Um, and so we need to create more opportunities there. And that will also create opportunities for us to take our, the research coming out of this community and have it 
the solutions be seen and the applications be seen. We're looking at some ways to expand uh, the work that the, the COL board through our board chair, Rob Dunbar, has already, and others, Mark Abbott at uh, OSU, have already begun looking at uh, a particular type of workshop on expanding the OA sensor network, um, taking complex issues that uh, across multiple disciplines that have societal relevance uh, among them, I guess, is, is OA, also cyber. There will be other ideas here. So the idea is to take something that could be a very, um, that's in part a very science-oriented workshop, but also give it a broader frame where we can communicate those ideas to a broader policy audience in Washington that will understand the impact and that will help us bring um, technology development more to the forefront of the discussion. Okay, so uh, you know, when you look at this list of our ocean ambassadors here, uh, there's two things you notice. They're either old or fictitious. <laughs> so they've all been great. I mean, we grew up with them, or at least people as old as me grew up with these, with these folks. But now we need some new champions, okay? Uh, we've got some of them right here in the room. Uh, Gary, our own Gary Griggs. But here are just a few other ideas. Some here, of course, from California. Leon Panetta serves with me on the Joint Ocean Commission. Of course, he was our Secretary of Defense and wore many other hats. And he's uh, still a strong voice. Of course, uh, Congressman Sam Farr. Uh, Senator Murkowski has become a good ocean champion. She and Senator King formed the Arctic Caucus. We need to have uh, champions that are bipartisan, bicameral. We need industry, uh, military, um, and technology. So uh, Jim Cameron, the Schmitz, uh, Admiral Ted Allen from the Coast Guard. Uh, these are just some ideas, and I hope we will develop others um, other voices, other ways of telling our, our story and taking our conversation um, to more. So I want to now end by asking you to help share with me your thoughts on how we can change the conversation and uh, how together we can help navigate these seas ahead of us. Thank you. Sherry, you mentioned, uh, so there are a number of things that you've got planned, uh, the convening of the Federal Chief Ocean Scientists, the um, uh, gathering of this council of folks to, to look at various topics, et cetera. What's the timeline for those things? Can you tell us, and, and how is that going to be by invitation? I mean, what's the process that you envision for making that happen? Okay, uh, good question, Chris. Well, the, the chief ocean scientists were convening our first meeting at the end of this month. June 30th is the first meeting. I'm, I'm uh, hoping that we will, this, we will have this meeting uh, perhaps quarterly uh, or, you know, as, as schedules permit. Uh, the first one is going to be, you know, an opportunity just for them to talk among themselves because I want it to be a comfortable, comfortable for them to gather in this way. Um, and then we're going to kind of see where they want to take it. I can see that evolving into a form where, you know, we might have uh, some of, you know, you come and present to them on a specific subject if there's an interest or ways to interact, um, you know, directly through this form. Um, so but we're going to start this way and, and hope to evolve it into a regular meeting where we can understand kind of what their requirements are, what their needs are, and uh, then we will also have an opportunity to feed our needs into them. And, uh, you know, in the first instance, I will use, you know, the process that we have within, you know, ocean leadership, as you know, uh, you know, being a, a member and a trustee, our board structure to ensure that everyone is fully informed uh, about what's happening um, in that, uh, with that group. On the uh, Oceans and National Security Council, um, you know, we're working, working that scope now. I want to launch that, um, you know, in, in the fall. That's an effort where, I, you know, I'd like to have some, we need to have some good uh, 
partners uh, supporting us on that kind of initiative to keep it going. My timeline on that is I would like us to, you know, I've done these kind of projects. It takes about a year to do, you know, one good project where you get a report. Uh, you have time to have some meetings, you know, of the council, take some deep dives on particular areas, digest that, and then come up with a report that then you are ready to release and communicate. Um, I'd like to have that by the end, you know, the first report, you know, and the, the second half of 2016 so that we have something to communicate to the next administration, um, whoever is heading it, on oceans and national security and use that as a way, as a, a, a platform for which to engage a broader national conversation in this area. Uh, on the oceans, um, and industry engagement, uh, I see that as a series of kind of rolling opportunities. Uh, the first one coming up is in the fall, uh, I think it's in September, where there's a, the conference in Washington of the Marine Technology Society. We've been working um, with our trust, one of our trustees, Hank Loeb of Sonar 9, some of our members, along with Shell, to design a series of uh, um, panels at that conference, two panels, I think, on um, uh, science needs for offshore energy development uh, and some related topics. And I think that's one way of bringing industry involved and getting industry involved. I would, um, I am open to other ideas and I'm really looking at sort of how we can specifically look, look with you at, at that. And the technology development uh, as I said, the one the piece that we're working now is using the uh, work that the board has already begun on ocean technology futures and developing a specific workshop uh, on ocean acidification sensors and using that as a way to sort of expand the te and launch the technology development initiative. Yes? I have run into an argument mostly online to the effect that, of course, climate scientists argue that global warming is a threat. Their funding depends upon it. As long as they can convince the world that there's a threat, they're going to keep getting paid. Now, you don't have to believe this nonsense. It's a conspiracy theory. They have all conspiracy theories. But there's a germ of reality behind it. They are subject to a conflict of interest. Scientists who say, we need more funding are discounted because, of course, they would say that. It's going into their pockets. And scientists who say that global warming is a threat or ocean acidification is a threat are similarly discredited because they're accused of having a conflict. How do you get around that? How do you tell people that the science is real and the scientists who argue that it's real are not subject to a conflict of interest? Well, I think first and foremost, you have to have other voices on this subject. That's, that's why, you know, because it is such an erroneous and specious argument. Uh, one could, um, uh, you know, I think you have to stand up for what you do and the integrity of the science behind your research. Um, I think you have to show that in the work that you do, you're, you know, you're free from conflict, you know, you're free from from conflicts of interest. It's not like you're getting, you know, it's not like you're becoming billionaires from doing science, right? Uh, for the most part, unless you start, you know, your own for-profit company. But, you know, academic science research um, is really of a, of a different nature. I, I've encountered that. I don't think that's the biggest challenge that's faced here. Um, I think the, the deeper, uh, the more, um, compelling argument that I've heard from those who want to attack climate science make is that um, there's too much uncertainty and they don't understand, you know, the models aren't really accurate in predicting, um, you know, what the impacts will be and that there are higher priorities that we should have in terms of how we invest. I, I think the, the period in which the climate science per se has been attacked was, I, I was seeing that much more five years ago. I think in the policymaking community in Washington um, has 
somewhat moved away. I'm not saying it's not there at all, but I think the more uh, threatening arguments have come in the form of, okay, we understand that climate change is happening, um, but, you know, there are other bigger threats out there. Um, and, you know, we, we first need to deal with them, and this is going to be something our grandkids are having to deal with. So I, you know, I think there's still going to be a lot of debate about what we should do about it, and should we be um, in, you know, investing in today in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, or should we be investing, um, you know, in the next generation of infrastructure for the country? And so, you know, you could make the argument they're connected, uh, and certainly one does. But I, th that's the more compelling set of arguments I, I hear. And I'll also say, you know, we faced a similar little, a similar argument um, the CNA Military Advisory Board in, in one of the reports it put out. There was one, one paper went after some of the members, some of the military uh, members of the board. These are all retired generals and four stars and said, they only do this because, you know, they are getting paid. Or they are, and... Uh, you know, what were they getting paid? Maybe a thousand dollars a day, you know, as an honorarium. I mean, nothing compared to what they could make, um, you know, in their consulting for defense industry. So they obviously weren't doing it um, in order to, you know, for, for the money. They were doing it out of a sense of, of service and uh, commitment to the idea and belief in the idea. So sometimes you just have to let those not even distinguish the argument and let it go. So the, yes, the I'm sorry, can I ask you, I, I know some of you, but you could identify yeah, yourself. Yeah, I'm Jeff Wheat. Um, the, the House budget uh, doesn't look so good in uh, 2016, especially for Earth Sciences. So then uh, what are you guys doing on the uh, Senate side to hopefully jack that up? And yeah, that's the action this week <clears throat> and next. Okay, so that, you know, the House, the House Competes Act uh, really takes a whack at um, uh, the NSF geosciences budget, and uh, the um, appropriations bill is really not is really no better. Um, and so, in the Senate, we've been working hard. To, we've been working hard to get to each of the members of the CJS Appropriations Subcommittee, which is chaired by Senator Shelby. Uh, Senator Feinstein is on that committee as well, um, and as is Senator Murkowski and some other. So there's some key. I mean, the, the focus here is on ensuring that the Republican leadership in the Senate doesn't take the same action that the House did. They're not poised to. I don't think they think about it the same way. We're not getting the, the sense from the staff that they're going to going to do that. Uh, but, you know, you don't want to take too much risk. So we have been uh, asking our members to reach out to each of those members. We've been sending letters. We've been communicating on it. I've discussed it directly with Senator Murkowski, uh, myself. Um, and, you know, I, so I think the action there is going to be set, uh, June 9th is their markup for the CJS appropriations bill um, in the Senate. And so hopefully they will not take the same action. I think that's, I think it's pretty clear that they, they won't take the same cuts, but it'll still be a matter for conference uh, later this year. So it's something that still is going to require um, a fair amount of attention and, uh, and watching. And, you know, the best things we could do is to get sort of oil and gas industry out there as voices of why the NS, why geosciences is their workforce. Uh, and also enable the Texas delegation in particular because in the House it's chaired by uh, uh, Lamar Smith of the House Science Committee and then uh, Congressman Culberson chairs the CJS Appropriations Subcommittee. Uh, so really there's a lot, of, a lot of power in Texas right now. Yes? I'm Dave Clay. As a, as a follow-up to Jeff's question, is the antipathy towards geosciences in the House driven entirely by climate, or are there other factors that enter into their singling out geosciences for such substantial cuts? I think a good deal of it is mixed 
is a combination of misunderstanding and skepticism about misunderstanding about the extent to which the geoscience funding is climate science because it's not all climate science and then some and climate skepticism as well as misunderstanding about kind of the value of geosciences um, overall and then there appeared to be there was a report uh, about a year ago, I think, from a conservative think tank that made the argument that um, the four other directorates in NSF, not geo and not social behavioral sciences, contributed more to economic development uh, and economic growth in this country. Uh, it, it wasn't, I read the report, it wasn't a very compelling argument, but it seems to have gotten some traction. Um, in certain quarters, and led to um, this sense that okay, well, we can we can continue funding in these areas, but we should defund in those areas, and that seemed to be combined with a sense that well, we don't want to do anything that's climate related. Now, I also have seen you know a letter from a Republican congressman in Texas who made the argument no geosciences is actually here's what it does: oil and gas industry supports natural hazards and weather research you know, supports other basic fundamental research that we need that's good for our economy. Oh, and yes, and by the way, make sure all the things in Texas get funded so we support that. <laughs> <laughs> and you probably know what they are. So uh, there's a little bit of, let's say, protect, it's, it's kind of a, you're working with how formal you're working going on, you know, in the post earmark uh, era, uh, people, Find workarounds, and you know that's you know it, it seems to be that that's occurring right now at the expense of a broader community interest because you know some people will get their own, but not everybody may get their fair share. Yes. Uh, then just people. Um, so, how much of the opposition uh, to the initiatives like that you think are you know resulting from? Um, on sort of the interest in that um, opening of the polar region you know, as a result of the climate change to the like you know economic uh, development you know resources um, strategic military it's like uh, it's like I mean, the whole region kind of opening and up I mean, you got to be you know, somebody interested in exactly so I, I think this is one of the ways we begin to turn around that argument because certainly if, if you're Senator Murkowski and you care deeply about what's happening in the Arctic and you have um, you know a, a large number of research institutions in Alaska from University of Alaska at Fairbanks to a number of other institutions who are benefiting from NSF research both in the, that's funded by the polar uh, funded within GEO, in certain parts of GEO, whether Polar or OCE, um, it's not in your interest to have that funding cut. And I, she and her and her folks, I, I believe, understand that. Now, I think there's also an important argument to be made, um, you know, beyond the constituent level, that is the, the you know, geostrategic situation of the Arctic is changing um, as it opens up. Uh, we need better to uh, we need better to understand those changes that are happening in the Arctic. The, we need better observations. We need better monitoring, um, and we need more capability in the Arctic. Um, and that's been fair. I've written many pieces about that. And um, I mean, the, we are really underinvested in uh, in a variety of Arctic capabilities, and we're not prepared today to respond. Uh, should there be an accident or an incident uh, that either an oil spill or something requiring a search and rescue mission. The U.S. is really not ready yet. And uh, the Navy knows that. I think the Coast Guard knows that. But the investments needed to sort of in, in improve our capability continue to fall sort of just below what we, we call the sort of fit-up line, the five-year defense plan, because there are also very more very important other capabilities that are needed to uh, counter the uh, anti-axis threat in uh, China 
in the Pacific and other places around the world, Iran, ISIS, I mean, the list is quite long. So it's not, you know, uh, the world is complicated. But this is a region where we, will, where we need to think to the long term. Uh, we can't just be thinking the next year or the next five years. We need to have a long-term perspective on what kind of capabilities we're going to need to operate in the Arctic in the future. Yes? Long-term, my name's Kim Fulton Bennett. Um, what do you see as the sort of IUS ev evolution over the next 5, 10, 20 years? Does, does ocean leadership have a, a direction? That, do you like things to go, or what do you, how do you, what are some of the options that you think you're out there? Oh, good, good question. And, uh, you know, I, I'm still learning about this program, but I will say as I've come, as I'm getting right into it and I see uh, the opportunity, we, you know, and we sort of coordinate some of the interagency parts of that program at Ocean Leadership. You know, I see that there's a great opportunity to use that program. Um, and it's uh, the fact that it's located around the country and has a network, a community-based network of users um, to really grow support for ocean sciences mm -hmm. and um, be part of the voice, enable us to expand the voice and the value of the ocean sciences, the observations and the monitoring. What it does seems very good. I'd like to give it a larger voice. I'd like ultimately to um, figure out how we connect it with the larger OOI. As someone who doesn't, you know, initially didn't grow up in this community, I came in, I'm reading about, you know, getting briefed on OOI over here and I use over here. And I'm thinking, well, why, why are they, what's the connection here? And, um, you know, the connection is it's two different funding agencies and, you know, one more, slightly more applied than the other, but, you know, if I were trying to explain this to my mother, it would all be the same kind of thing, right? So I think, you know, we, we need to be able to connect those dots a little bit more and connect the user communities a little bit more and enable the, the science to be threaded throughout. Um, you know, and so that's partly a sort of an interagency challenge. It's partly a communications challenge. Um, and, but it's one that, you know, I think for the benefit of this community and for our need, because it's all part of building up a, a, a greater coastal resiliency um, and being able to respond to increasing coastal challenges. Yes? Drew Burrier, uh, Moss Landing Marine Lab. Um, given the climate that we've been talking about for ocean sciences, um, what role has ocean leadership identified for early career science? scientists, excuse me, um, both from a funding perspective and an engagement perspective? Well, um, great question. Um, you know, I'd like to have a program where we have uh, early career scientists who are, have broad-based opportunities for policy internships um, in Washington, because I would like to see more scientists who sort of understand how things work in Washington and have opportunities to sort of take that experience back into um, their scientific research so we can be more intimately connected. And so I've seen some of that, but I'd really love to be able to grow a dedicated program um, in that area. I've seen that happen, you know, I, I see that um, there are places, let's say, in the national security community where there are various types of internship policy, early career leadership initiatives uh, for young professionals that do a great job um, in sort of enabling uh, young professionals to come to Washington. So that's something I'm very interested in. Um, Gloria, I don't know if you asked that question with a specific idea in mind. You want to come be the first. Uh, Oh well, policy intern. I need some funding for it, so uh, I have to figure out how we how we put all those pieces together. Uh, but I can I can see the merit and the value and the value of that. And uh, as I learn more about sort of the educational opportunities, um, you know, there is of course the Ocean Leadership has the National Ocean Science Bowl, which is the high school quiz bowl for ocean scientists. And thank you to all of you who part participated in various regional versions of that, I think that is a great way to get 
um, high school students engaged in, um, in the ocean sciences. And uh, I know that Rob Dunbar and some others of you are involved in sort of the undergraduate education level work. And then, you know, I think there are, I'd like to see something where undergraduates or um, gra graduates, uh, graduates who haven't yet finished their um, graduate and, and uh, doctoral studies have some op exposure to Washington uh, to sort of keep them involved and, and interested. And then, of course, we've had some uh, postgraduate, postdoc type of programs, but I think those also could uh, be expanded on as well. Rob? So, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> one expansion to mention is the Marine Geosciences Leadership Symposium. So, they both, yeah. so that, that was started by Ocean Leadership and brings in 25 to 30 people that are assistant professors, postdocs. Um, it targets that, you know, new practitioner cohort. And they're there for a week. Um, they meet with leaders of the National, National Science Foundation. They meet with senators, Congress people. Uh, they get some media training. Um, and they learn how to network with each other as kind of a self-supported group. And, now that's been restricted to the geosciences, and it was at one point linked to ocean drilling, but a lot of other communities have said, hey, why don't we have a marine biology leadership symposium, or more apropos right now, because we need some startup energy, is um, ocean, an ocean observing leadership symposium, where you get a cohort of people, uh, it's competitive to get in, but you get these people in there, and they really respond. And in that case, you would teach them about this array that's being made available. Because it's our impression that at the moment, not very many people really know what it is that's been built. <laughs> well, that actually might be, that's a great idea, because that might be something NSF could be interested in within the next year or so, um, to really get that launch. And that would help us build that user community. Yes? I don't see that to be from a barn. Uh, all of this discussion has been interesting, but you haven't you haven't addressed the major problem. And the major problem, in my mind, is that you know, it's a democracy. We have congressmen and senators, and they react to how the constituents vote. And how are you going to get the message to Joe Six Pack? How are you going to get the message to Joe Six Pack? You can talk scientist to scientist all you want but you're preaching to the choir, doesn't work. How do you get the message to Joe Sixpack sitting in Nebraska that only cares about his life right now? I mean, I gave a lecture, I gave a talk, and I brought up the issue that, you know, half of the oxygen you breathe comes from the ocean, and if you kill, you know, the phytoplankton in the ocean, guys, this is gonna affect you, and everybody was shocked. Seriously? I don't like fish anyway, you know, I got sort of that. <laughs> but I have to read. So my question is, how do you get hold of Joe Sixpack and make him see that there's a problem enough for him to write a senator or congressman? Right. Well, it takes a you know, it takes a lot of a variety of efforts. And some of them are embedded in, in what I just discussed. One is, you know, with an Oceans and National Security Initiative, we'll be able to change the conversation in certain parts of the country. I've seen that as, as uh, we've taken our military leaders around the country who've had conversations uh, with Joe Sixpack about um, why clean energy and climate change uh, matters to them uh, in Nebraska, in Louisiana, uh, in other parts of the country. Now, is it a, has it been a complete change? No, it hasn't fully, but you know, it, it has. It has begun to change the conversation. That's one, you know, that's that's one piece of it. Um, the, you know, the other the other piece of it is, uh, as you say, scientists aligning with also with industry. I've uh, been with uh, a Hui scientist in a conversation that she had with uh, a Tennessee chemical company about why. Um, uh, air-sea interactions and changes in, in the ocean are affecting agriculture in Tennessee and in the heartland uh, where they get their crops from feed into their, their chemical feed stock. 
And they were so convinced by this that they not only invested in her research, but they made part of their corporate sustainability argument and their arguments to their Tennessee congressional delegation. And oh, by the way, Senator Lamar Alexander chairs an important congressional committee. Um, uh, that they should uh, that ocean sciences and ocean research is uh, part of what they want to invest in in their corporate responsibility. So you know, I think it is. I think it's possible. It takes a lot of effort by a lot of people, um, and some of it will be organized by ocean leadership, and some of it will be organic and spun out. And you all will have ideas, and others hopefully will be part of it as well. well I have one suggestion. I mean, basically. I'm 65. I remember driving the highways of America back when I was young and how absolutely filthy, you know, everybody threw everything out the windows and the sides of the highways. Were, and then all of a sudden they, there was this concerted national program about, you know, don't pollute, don't throw it out your window, da 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 da. And I was amazed that in a reasonable amount of time the highways started getting cleaned up. I suggest that somebody, maybe Eric and Wendy, start funding advertisements to tell the truth about climate change and how it's going to affect people, whether it's their oxygen or everything else. But you know, maybe you need an advertising program because you know, the other side has plenty of advertising. You know, maybe you need to get some advertising out there because you got to get Joe's six pack. And I am not convinced anything that's been said here is addressing Joe's six pack. Well, broad-based communications does matter, and uh, that's why you know. And those and those investments can be um, critical, um, and they, they require investment. You know, they're not they're not cheap to have those broad-based campaigns. Um, so yes, the more champions we have, the more with, the more people are willing to invest in a broad range of efforts, um, particularly you know communications at that level. I think that's also very helpful. Yes. Thank you, Sharon. And also, thanks, Steve, for giving that talk. I have a couple comments. One is that, uh, you know, these new ideas, um, um, by the way, Kevin Cole wants 90 million miles. Um, with a new idea like climate change, um, there's a, initially it goes through a progression of, um, you know, uh, first uh, abject rejection, then there's a begrudging acceptance. And then I think your problem will be solved when everybody has a personal experience of climate change in, in their lives. And people in Houston are having that experience. Um, people in the East Coast are having that experience. People in the North are having that experience. Um, that's going to turn around pretty quick. Um, I'm a little concerned about when everybody does embrace the fact of climate change in their lives, um, they're going to come back to the scientists and they're going to go, well, what are you going to do about it? And, um, and so NRC has just advanced the notion that NSF and other funding agencies should support research into geoengineering strategies. Um, and they're looking at albedo modification, but they're also looking at carbon sequestration. Both of these are going to have a huge impact on ocean systems, and I'm just wondering when you get out ahead of the curve and you stop arguing about whether climate change is real or not, what is ocean leadership's position on geoengineering strategies? There's a question. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about this. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's why we have a board led by our esteemed <laughs> Rob Dunbar. I mean, we all have our views on geoengineering. I, I've been part of different studies on it, but you know, it's something that we'll have to collectively uh, come to grips with um, and decide the time, you know, when we need to do it and, and how we need to approach it. But you're right; it's it's part of you know, it will be in the solution set in the future, and people will have different views on it, and it's something we'll have to take a good look at. I mean, Marsha McNutt's one of our trustees and was a co-author on the NRC report on geoengineering. Right. And she's uh, definitely an effective voice right. in, in uh, our group. Um, I, it, you know, everybody has their own personal views and take on that. It's incorrect to think that ocean leadership <laughs> has an official position on geoengineering, except to say that, you know, it may be good, it may be bad, but if you don't study it, model it, 
uh, look at the different proposals that are out there, then you can get engage in an intelligent conversation about it. So I think that, that's where the community is. And we'll, at the end of the day, we'll see how far that NRC report goes, um, if it affects any changes. I know DOE's picked it up, and they're, they're quite interested in aspects of it, and I've seen less action at the National Science Foundation. Other questions for Sherry? Well, if not, then uh, please join me in thanking her. And uh, thank you. Thank you, folks.